might get word out about this event into the public media, um, but uh, it might have been too late. Uh, at any rate, uh, just for those of you who don't know, or maybe haven't been to the East Asia Center election series before, uh, the East Asia Center uh, is uh, a part of the institution of the University of Virginia that brings together all the people from the schools and departments across rounds who deal with East Asia. Uh, and it is funded by, uh, in part by the Wheaton Foundation, uh, and those funds uh, support this lecture series, for example. So it allows us to bring in people from outside to talk about East Asia. Um, and usually it's individual speakers. Um, but uh, recently I've been thinking about the media in China, and uh, uh, through my own experiences, I've been getting to know more and more journalists who cover China, and some I've known for a long time, even before they were journalists. I think. Um, and so it occurred to me that it might be nice to have a panel. Uh, and it's, I think, also particularly interesting in this day and age when China's on the front page just about every day uh, to talk about how things have changed, not only in the field of journalism per se, but also in uh, where China is in the world today and how those two uh, interact with each other, especially now that we have so many different ways to communicate with each other. Um, Uh, and so the, I think the development of 
media in, in the last 30 years has greatly changed uh, the face of information being generated, let's say, for the American media audience about China. And uh, this is seen both in the rapidity and breadth of information that we're being exposed to, uh, as well as the quality of those who are generating this information, the people who are covering uh, China, as well as their diversity. So we're hearing a lot more voices, there's a lot more savvy, uh, there's a lot more uh, getting into specifics in, in various different realms. And, and I've watched this pro process with great admiration and appreciation uh, because in the early days, as an academic who studies China, I've often, you know, it's often given me pause. I, I think, you know, where is this guy coming from? He doesn't know anything about Chinese history, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But this kind of problem is much more rare now today. Uh, and there are reasons for this that we could probably go into uh, later that just go beyond the sheer numbers of people uh, engaged in this. I'm going to give a couple of anecdotes that sort of personalize this that will explain why we see these three here uh, before you today. Uh, two of them are stories about my relationship with Twitter. Uh, I'm, a, I'm usually an early adopter of new technology, as my colleagues often point out. Maybe it's because they're later than I am. But Twitter was not one of the things that I jumped onto uh, right when it began to exist. Um, and before I started using Twitter, I will confess that I was not an avid consumer of news about China. Uh, I did not have a subscription to a newspaper. I did not often watch the news on, on television. Uh, and so I, I think it's fair to say I was fairly not very well informed uh, about China, let's say up until uh, the, a few years ago, even. Um, and uh, so, and, and it didn't occur to me uh, before I started using Twitter that Twitter might be a way of becoming well informed about, about China. Uh, like a lot of people, I probably didn't have any idea what to do with Twitter uh, when I signed up for my little account. I'm not even sure why I signed up in the first place. So I signed up and I'm like, well, what am I doing here? What am I going to do? Uh, but sooner or later, it became increasingly evident to me, and I think the learning process of using Twitter is interesting in itself, that a really good thing to do is find journalists who cover China, and that becomes a great sort of clearinghouse for what's going on every day uh, uh, in China and the discussions going on among Chinese journalists. Um, and so in the process of doing that, I, uh, I added somebody uh, who was covering China named Melissa K. Chan, uh, uh, whose name didn't ring a bell with me for some reason. Uh, and I think I might have even uh, commented on a tweet or something like that, and Melissa said, is that Professor Laughlin? And, and I said, well, yeah, from Yale. And, and I said, yeah. And it turned out that when Melissa was an undergraduate at Yale, she took my class in Chinese literature uh, well before she began her, her career uh, in, uh, uh, in journalism. And, and so we were very happy to meet each other in that, in that context, but then I started following her. Much to my surprise and, and dismay, shortly thereafter, uh, uh, Melissa's visa gets non-renewed. She, she loses her uh, ability to remain in China and, and in, in effect, is deported uh, for reasons that uh, she could elaborate on uh, uh, or you might ask about it in, in, uh, uh, in discussion. Of course, it has to do with the nature and content of her uh, uh, hard-hitting reporting uh, for Al Jazeera English. But, uh, this, this made her into a news uh, story as well as a news producer, which I, I thought uh, was interesting. Uh, a similar story is uh, last uh, December, uh, as you may recall, Moynihan got uh, the Nobel Prize for Literature. By this time, I was happily, happily using Twitter. So I got up that morning, quickly saw that this was the case, that the announcement was out there at 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning. I started tweeting about Moynihan because I, I forgot to mention a professor of modern Chinese literature, so this is within my field. Uh, and I'm not an expert on Moynihan, but I have a sense of where he fits in, 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 in Chinese culture. So I started, you know, uh, I was very happy about this, and I started talking about why I thought this was significant. And um, journalists started contacting me uh, and asking me for more uh, about what I had to say about this, including um, PBS NewsHour, uh, which uh, fortunately, due to reasons of geography, I was able to personally go uh, and, uh, and, uh, and talk to. Uh, and uh, uh, so, like four or five minutes on national television uh, uh, is, is a big deal, of course, but it's also quickly forgotten. And I felt like, well, you know, I, I want to say more than five sentences about this. So I started thinking about things to write, and I posted something on uh, a list serve within my field where other professors of Chinese literature uh, see uh, uh, what each other has to say, but it's not really, you know, the public hardly ever gets to see it. Uh, but um, Susie 
James, and another one of our guests here, uh, who's also a member of MCLC, right? But I don't remember how this thing came to see that. But you'd seen this thing I wrote about Moyan, and then I was trying to explain why I thought he was transcribing mouse talks at the Yemen forum uh, in a way that didn't sound so bad. Uh, and, uh, and Susie told me about China Plot, and, which I was not aware of before. Um, and, uh, and so it came later that Harry Lake wrote an article about Moyan and, and his literature. And I thought I wanted to write more, and Susie encouraged me to write up an article to appear in China Plot. Uh, and then later on, uh, 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 probably largely thanks to Susie, the editor of the Chinese edition of the New York Times, uh, wanted to put it in, in the New York Times. And so it was technically available to Chinese readers, except for the fact that the New York Times is, is, is shut down in China uh, due to reasons of their recent reporting. But that actually didn't stop people from reading it, because I, in the meantime, discovered Weibo, the Chinese equivalent of Twitter. Uh, and I set up an account there. And through uh, the magic of, of uh, you know, using Yiddish files instead of text, I was able to get my article uh, circulating among larger and larger groups. Uh, uh, in the Chinese internet, and so I got a lot of feedback, both from the American side and from the Chinese side. It's become a very interesting discussion. We don't have to talk much about Moyan today. I'm giving a talk specifically about Moyan in this series on March 1st, so we can continue that then. But I wanted this to be another example of how Twitter has enabled me as an academic who's trying to get outside of the ivory tower to engage in public discourse about issues that uh, are interesting to the general public. Um, so I just wanted to uh, 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 sort of put, put our guests into context a little bit. As for Isaac uh, Stonefish, um, I, I'm not as familiar uh, with his work, and I haven't been uh, interacting with him uh, as actively as, as the other two guests. But um, I do have a sense of how uh, foreign policy kind of fits into this framework. Um, because I, had, I, I, I was talking with Melissa over lunch about the situation and how journalism has changed. If I think about what I thought of foreign policy before it went onto the internet, if, I, you know, if I'm standing in front of a newsstand and I'm thinking about what to read, I'm not likely to have grabbed foreign policy to read because I'm a, you know, literature is my field, international relations is not. So to, to, to reach over that chasm was a much bigger deal for me then. But once foreign policy became digital and I was following Isaac and, and some of his colleagues on Twitter, I began to see what interesting things they were writing and saying about China across disciplines. And so this became also, I think, a very energizing thing about how social media and uh, the internet have changed the, the coverage of China. And like I say, seeing it from many different, um, uh, from many different perspectives. So, so that's kind of my personalized introduction of, of, our, of our three guests. Um, I, I won't uh, give you the sort of standard blurb uh, because that was in the literature that, that we sent out. Uh, but if you have more questions about uh, the specifics of, of their background, we can get into that during the question and answer session. So I'd like to move on to the second part where each of our uh, guests, maybe starting with um, Melissa, going from right to left, uh, uh, we can uh, hear their sort of self uh, introduction uh, with a focus on this uh, historical trajectory. Uh, uh, and uh, and then the answer to that question about what the public needs to know about about this situation. So thank you for your time and uh, thank you for coming. Um, does the microphone work? Okay. Um, so I'm currently a Nigerian fellow at Stanford, working on something slightly different but related. I'm looking at ways reporters can improve their digital security, and this was born from my personal experience and the experience of my peers in China. Because as you've seen in the news, there's a lot of stuff out there these days about Chinese hackers. Um, I was Al Jazeera English's China correspondent for five years, did something like 400 plus reports, not all of them um, on China. I also went to South Korea, Mongolia, North Korea. Um, so that was very interesting. And um, in terms of a little bit more about my background, uh, I started off at ABC News, had freelance for them, had freelance for CBS News, CNN. I did some work with Star News Asia, the satellite channel on, in Asia before it went defunct. And I am fluent in Mandarin and Cantonese Chinese. Uh, how I ended up about Jazeera is that I wanted to be in China ahead of the Olympics in 2008. And the English channel had launched in late 2006. So I joined them in early 2007. So as for your question, um, if 
question posed is, what is the most important thing the public needs to know about reporting in China today and why? I thought about this. I think I'm going to tell you the answer in the form of a story. I know a few reporters who covered China in the 1980s. This was the decade when foreign correspondents were setting up their bureaus for the first time in China after a many decades long hiatus. Uh, pretty much uh, most foreign correspondents left after the Civil War ended in China in the late 1940s. And so back in the 1980s, if you were a reporter in China and you wanted to do a story outside of Beijing, and actually this happened well into the 1990s, you needed permission. You have to write a very formal letter. You have to send it uh, to um, the provincial capital, the place you wanted to go, and you have to sit and wait. And even if you did get permission to go cover a story, you fly there, and from the moment you landed, there would be essentially a minder or a group of minders taking you from place to place. So you really couldn't get a full, true picture of China. Anyone you interviewed was, you know, if there were Communist Party officials that accompanied um, you. So it came as a big surprise um, when these reporters who had been in China in the 80s told me that, um, that my job, our job was, is a lot harder than it was in the 1980s. And so, what's going on now? Um, when I want to go anywhere in China to store, I can just get on a plane. So, why is that so hard? As I thought about it, it makes sense because you land. Well, I work in television, we have all pieces of gear coming along with us. We stick out like a sore thumb if we're landing in a provincial or even a small size airport. And um, maybe someone will follow us, right, when we get into our car. Um, maybe the people we plan on interviewing will be intimidated into withdrawing their interview. And that has happened. Um, when you check into your hotel, you're required to hand over your passport, and then they photocopy it, photocopy the page um, with your visa on it, and then they fax it over to the local police station. So sometimes, I've checked in, I've gotten into my room, and five minutes later, I might get a knock on the door. In other words, you could travel very far from Beijing, uh, fly four hours, drive another 13, get stopped at a police checkpoint. You just don't know what's going to happen. And I guess that, you know, um, covering China 30 years ago, you could know at least the limitations you were working in. But now, um, we don't know where the line is. The area is far greater, and there's a lot of guesswork involved. And I think that's what the reporters were talking about. There's a lot more stress and paranoia. I mean, you are spending a lot of money flying a three-person crew somewhere. And uh, just as an example, um, the self-immolations in Tibet, a lot of journalists tried to go into those areas, and they would travel for days or something and, and get stopped. So that's the current situation in China, and I think that's what those reporters meant when they said that things are actually more difficult to cover than 30 years ago. Hello? Yeah. Alright. So my name is Isaac Sonfish. I'm an associate editor at Foreign Policy Magazine in DC. So I'm going to tell you very briefly how I got into covering China, and then answer Charles' question. So, I grew up in Syracuse, New York. I don't know if anyone's been to Syracuse, but not exactly the most exciting place. Uh, very close to my family, but I wanted to get as far away as possible as soon as I could. So, when I was 17, I spent a summer in Xinjiang, Western China. I was 18, I spent a summer in Tibet. And I got the bug. So, I'm not a summer bug, that is later. <laughs> I'm covering China bug. And I you know, majored in Chinese literature in college. I thought it was a good compromise if I could do something practical and learn Mandarin while also studying literature, which not the most practical thing, but a lot of fun. So that was kind of a compromise that I made with myself. And then right after college, moved to Beijing, uh, worked as a literary agent for a few years looking for Chinese authors to sell to Western publishers, basically looking for the Chinese Murakami, which uh, doesn't exist. Uh, might come out at some point, but you know, even with Moyan winning the Nobel Prize, there's basically no Chinese authors that people in the States uh, want to read or buy, which is a shame, but hopefully it will change. Uh, I think the best-selling book 
written by a Chinese, translated into English, is still not a little red book. I think by a long shot, I don't think anything has gotten close since then. So, uh, it's a field under development. I did that for a few years and then decided that, you know, instead of being a midwife, I wanted to produce stories myself. So, freelanced for a few years and then got a job at Newsweek um, before things completely went south. I'm sure you guys have seen what happened to Newsweek. So, a little bit before it was uh, before it was too bad, and then about 14 months ago, decided to move back to the states. Got a job with foreign policy, and have been trying to build up Asia coverage, trying to get people to focus less on Latin America and the Middle East and more on Asia, where things matter a lot more, in my opinion. So to answer Charles' question, uh, what the public needs to know about doing journalism in China. Uh, two things that I think are the most important and are kind of the most misunderstood. And one is about foreign reporters in China versus Chinese reporters. Uh, most of them might disagree, but reporting in Beijing, uh, with very few exceptions, is extremely safe. Uh, there, there's very little that police or plainclothes thugs will do to foreign reporters. And being, especially if what happens to be white as opposed to Chinese, you stand out so much. People know it's a major international story if the foreign reporter gets roughed up or kicked out. Uh, and so they, you know, it's a lot of discretion with how Chinese deal with foreign reporters. Um, people would ask me, oh, so you were a journalist in Beijing. Does that mean you got censored all the time? No, I mean, there's nothing that they can do other than making it difficult to get interviews or you know, threatening people you talk to to you know, affect our reporting that way. Uh, that said, I think someone uh, maybe was former Guardian correspondent used the phrase ring of fire to describe reporting in China, and that you're there, you're protected, but it's very easy for you to burn your sources, for you to endanger the people that you talk to. So for example, if you go and you interview a dissident, they're not going to rough you up, they're not going to throw you in jail, but they might throw the dissident in jail, uh, they, they might harass his family. So you're completely safe, but you realize that by doing what you're doing, by trying to get the news, you're putting other people in danger. So you know, that's kind of something that I feel gets missed a lot of times when people talk about reporting in China. Uh, the second thing related to that, and this actually took me a lot longer to realize than, uh, well, anyway, uh, than I wish I'd known this earlier, but you read Xinhua or China Daily or Global Times, the state media in China, and you think to yourself, oh, shit. And uh, this is terrible. Like, who are the people that are producing this? And then it must just be these Communist Party apparatchiks, automatons who have no idea what's going on and just kind of live in their own little world. And you actually meet these people and understand that they have such a better, more nuanced understanding of what's going on in China than you know, maybe I did. Um, you know, some of my best sources when I were in Beijing were Chinese journalists uh, because a lot of them are very aware of what's happening in China, and also very aware of their own limitations because of the publication they work for. And so a lot of them have stories that they want to break, um, you know, have a really good understanding of what's actually happening, but are only able to publish a very limited number of that. So you know, they, some very remarkable and very great people, that doesn't really come through when you read some of the drivel that gets published in these publications. Thanks. So I'm Susie Jakes, um, and I, as Charles said, this uh, newly launched online magazine about China called China File, which uh, includes a whole range of different kinds of uh, reporting, writing, photography, and video on China. Um, I uh, became a reporter several years after I first met Professor Laughlin. I'm very grateful for inviting me to this Laughlin anymore. <laughs> Um, uh, I got interested in China just uh, because I wandered into a really terrific uh, Chinese history class when I was uh, an undergraduate, and then uh, I spent uh, some time studying in, in China, in Beijing, and in Harbin in the far northeast. Um, I guess Isaac also studied. Um, and uh, which, this was after college. I returned to the U.S. and my first job was working as an interpreter um, and translator and sort of all-around assistant to um, 
to Weijing Shum, who was a, a democracy activist in the late 1970s, um, spent about well, close to 19 years in, uh, in prison in China for his democracy advocacy, and then was released um, into exile in the United States in the, in the late 90s, um, around the time of President Clinton, a little after President Clinton uh, took a big trip to, to China. Um, and I had read, I had read his uh, letters from prison and found him inspiring. And, and through a sort of series of personal coincidences, I wound up working for him when he, when he first came to the U.S. Um, and um, and after about a year of that, um, during which time he was often interviewed by journalists who were either based in China or who were interested in China or in the United States, um, I decided. Um, I kind of wanted to go back and see how things looked myself. I mean, I, I was basically his, um, uh, I was, he didn't speak English, so I translated for him, and I was often, often conveying his vision of China, um, which was deeply inflected by his own experiences, and, and, and in many ways by the fact that he had spent 19 years in prison to journalists, and I wanted to see how things looked on the ground and if they were similar or dissimilar to, to how he described them. And so I, um, I first went to work for Time Magazine uh, in Hong Kong, and I was based in Hong Kong for a couple of years reporting from there, but also often taking trips to mainland China to report there, and then I became Time's correspondent in Beijing for about five years. Um, then I came back to the U.S. because I was sort of frustrated with um, commercial journalism and uh, I wanted to um, spend time reading and thinking and doing kind of longer form writing and so I spent um, a few years back at Yale where I had been undergraduate in a PhD program in Chinese history um, and I had just finished my oral exams when I got a call from um, my current boss, Orville Schell, who's the uh, director of the Central and U.S. China Relations Asia Society and a long time um, reporter and writer on China. Uh, and he said, I'm starting this, I want to start this new online magazine about China. Would you like to come um, work on it with me? Um, and for a variety of personal reasons, uh, it was a good time to take a little bit of time off from my um, PhD. And so I, I joined the Asia Society and we spent the last uh, two, almost two and a half years, creating this new publication um, with the goal of trying to, in some ways, supplement the reporting that uh, exists in for-profit publications. Um, one of our big interests is in trying to get uh, scholars of China to write and communicate more with, with non-scholarly audiences. We also felt like there was a need to create a platform for writers in China who are interested in writing for U.S. audiences to be able to do that and to do it in a way that would actually be accessible to um, non-specialist audiences, so that's one of the things that we do. Um, we also wanted to support more visual storytelling because we thought that that was important and uh, news magazines like Time and Newsweek, which used to support terrific photojournalism in China, no longer do that. So anyway, these are some of the things that we do. Um, as far as what's most important about doing journalism in China today, I guess um, what, I, what I was going to say was that, and which sounds very banal, is that China is a monolithic, um, and it's. Um, I think. I think my impression is that when people in the U.S. read stories about China, they read them with the. Um, often with the, the preconception of what they're reading um, has been written because it represents all of China. Um, or, you know, the stories that, if you read a story about China, that must be because whatever's in the story must be there because somebody thinks that, that the, or the person who wrote it wrote it because they want the reader to understand China. Um, and I think that the, um, the calculus, at least this was true for me, my colleagues, the calculus for a journalist in deciding what stories to write um, is very rarely um, because they want to educate their readers about China. It's much more often because something is a great story 
Um, it's an interesting story. Maybe they're, they have a sort of advocacy that in their journalism and they want to tell a story that they feel their colleagues in the Chinese press can't as easily tell. Um, maybe they're trying to right some injustice. Um, maybe something is, seems exciting. But I think often, um, you know, they're, the kinds of things that make for great stories um, and for important stories are, are sometimes, I think, interpreted as representing a larger whole that they don't always represent as well. So I, I think that's something important to keep in mind. I just, I thought I would just quickly respond to what Melissa said um, in terms of what's changed in the last uh, couple of decades. Um, I don't know, I mean, I always found that when I, I didn't travel with a team group, but I always found that when I traveled, generally, you know, sometimes I was followed, sometimes there were people messing with me, but I, my own experience was that there was an incredible range of different kinds of things that you could encounter in the course of reporting that went everywhere from, yeah, I think somebody knocked on your door and tell you to get out of town, or in one case I was actually pelted with cabbages. <laughs> in the village where people wanted me to leave. Um, but to having the very people who were supposed to be minding me actually, you know, giving me access to information that they really shouldn't have been giving me, or, you know, really making huge efforts to get information out on sensitive topics. Um, or, you know, individuals telling stories that, um, you know, that they knew might get them in trouble telling them anyway. So I, I'm not sure I think, I'm not sure I, I agree that um, the biggest change is sort of more tension or stress for foreign journalists by and large. I actually think we probably agree. Um, I think it depends on when you were a journalist in China. If you were um, in China from 2000 to 2008, that's very important because I was from pre-Olympics to post-Olympics. And I guess I should emphasize that things really changed after the Olympics and to return um, for a lot of times to work. Um, my voice is not enough. Um, ahead of the Olympics, it was a very free time to report in China. I was there for 18 months preceding the Olympics, and it was great. Um, my point is that things changed afterwards. China was under tremendous international pressure ahead of the Olympics to be as free as they could be. And I always have a question because tons, hundreds of journalists came just for the Olympics to cover China and do the China story ahead of the Olympics. This was China's coming out party. And I always said that it's very important what happens after the party's over. Um, and in, by 2009, you know, I think that things took a little bit. I think that I both of you would probably agree on that. So that's the kind of very much I'm looking at. I really think it depends on when you were quarter um, you know, in China. Uh, but certainly in the last three years, I think it's two steps back rather than one step forward. Um, the other thing that I want to address is what Isaac said um, earlier, which I think I posited perhaps that I might disagree, but I actually don't, um, which is the, the difference between foreign wars and China wars. I mean, I should step, step out and emphasize that China is really <coughs> physically safe for foreign reporters. I have never and never was worried about my physical peril, short of covering natural disasters in which I did feel unsafe. Um, so, so I think that, that you know, we're on the same page with that, and I, I should emphasize that the danger is not to me physically, the danger is not there. My story and the examples I gave is actually, the issue is getting the stories, right? That's where we're being stopped. And I do, did notice in um, pre-2009 versus post-2009, post-2009, um, the percentage of case times when we were stopped on the road um, did increase. By the time I left in 2012, I would say about 40% of the time there was some sort of um, barrier to our reporting, whether it was um, um, uniformed police or non-uniformed thugs. 
<clears throat> and I think one of the interesting things is that when we look at China, it's just so easy to want to go with a narrative that it's opening up, or its economy is developing, or it's liberalizing. And I mean, it's such a big, complex system that there's no way to, you know, to say that. We really do have to break it into specific periods. I mean, I think one of the most interesting changes between the 90s and then later when Ujitao took power is the access that uh, reporters have to government officials. Uh, John Zemin, who was president of China for most of the 90s, gave interviews. He gave long interviews. Uh, he spoke in English. He recited the Gettysburg Address. Mm -hmm. He kind of made a fool of himself, but he did it. He put himself out there. Uh, Hu Jintao, uh, who was president until, uh, or like, still is president, and Communist Party chairman until a couple months ago, uh, said nothing. You know, had no interaction with the international media at all. And I think, uh, for one, it's indicative of access that other government officials had to the Western media, but I think also him not saying anything when he gave a message to people below him that, okay, if Fujin Tao is not going to go and interact with the press, then maybe we should be a little more careful about doing so as well. One last thing I was going to add that I think has changed, um, even since I've been last there, is just the, um, the presence of um, microblogging in China, these sort of Twitter-like services, and um, uh, one of the one of the publications that my website works with um, is a you should all look at it if you're interested in the subject is a website called TV Nation, which um, does all of its reporting on um, on subjects that become popular memes on um, one of these um, microblogging things, places where people post kind of short, somewhat Twitter-like comments on, on um, a variety of subjects. And the and these sites are controlled, they're censored, there are certain topics that are totally off limits. There's a really interesting cat and mouse game between users and censors, so sometimes you can read those for a few minutes that then disappear. But I think, um, uh, so I was talking about this uh, last week with the editor of Cuban Nation. He made a, what I thought was a really interesting point, which is that as a foreign journalist, um, you know, I, I could often um, easily sit one-on-one -on -one with somebody and interview them in a whole variety of contexts. Um, not as often government officials, so we have senior government officials, but there are lots of stories for which you don't even really need to talk to government officials. They're, they're not the story, and I would argue in a lot of ways they're not the story. But um, you can have a conversation with somebody, but you're still a foreign reporter, you're still an outsider, and it can be difficult until you really get to know somebody well, which is often very difficult to do if you're working for a traditional media organization that doesn't give you the um, often doesn't give you the time to really get to know people well over a very long period of time. Um, it can be difficult to sort of hear people's just unvarnished opinions, and I think one of the really interesting things about, um, about Weibo on these microblogging sites is that they can give us um, access, not perfect access, but pretty impressive access to people's unvarnished uh, thoughts about all kinds of different topics. Uh, and I think that that provides a kind of window onto life in China, at least for the people that use these sites who are not, again, they're not a totally representative sampling of the Chinese populace, but in some ways it's as good a sampling as we can get for now. Um, and, and so I just think we're, we're now getting exposed to um, whole worlds of the interior life of people in China in a way that really wasn't possible before. And I don't know, I mean, I would be interested to hear people who have reported from China during the time when these things existed. Um, but, you know, it's just very different to kind of go online and be able to read thousands of posts on a topic than it is to sort of leave your office in the diplomatic compound in the middle of Beijing and try to go find people on the street to give you um, a sense. So I do think that in some ways this is functioning as a kind of a, a public square, and I think that that's, um, that's, a, that's a real change. Yeah, I think that the difference, that difference can be overemphasized. And although today's topic is generally about sort of English language coverage of China, 
the role that local journalism and local discourse plays in that has also been changing, I think. As you say, I think Weibo has been offering a new window into public discourse that has not been seen before. Uh, and there's an interesting resource, I think it's called Weibo Scope, I have a bunch of, uh, uh, I think it's Chinese University, or if you want to hold it. I think it's Chinese University of Hong Kong. It's just a web page that gives you the top about 40 or 50 uh, by number of hits uh, postings on Sinlong, so Sin is Weibo, uh, uh, in, in order of popularity that have uh, image attachments, which most do, like most people when they're posting Weibo, it's either a picture or they have an image file of an article that, that they're exchanging. So every day you can go and see what the buzz is, and sometimes it's really silly, ridiculous stuff, but uh, a lot of the time there's some stuff that's kind of pushing the envelope in terms of sensitivity. It's a good way to keep your thumb on the pulse of, of public discourse in China today. How much I want to turn in that direction. As long as we're talking about organizations here, one of the questions I circulated to the panel before was about uh, CCTV News, uh, which is a new uh, Washington-based uh, uh, channel for uh, China Central Television that is kind of an evolution out of their English language channel that they had uh, back in Beijing. And when uh, I was a part of a, a, a group of national committee uh, uh, guests of a lunch uh, in, in D.C. Uh, hosted by CCTV News, uh, we got basically their, their pitch, you know, what they think they are and what, what they're trying to do. Uh, and they compared themselves to Al Jazeera English, and they said, we want to be uh, an, uh, a 24-hour news organization on television that gives a different perspective than what they consider the sort of mainstream perspective of Fox and CNN uh, and the other major cable news organizations. And, and they very much promoted what they were doing in terms of spending more time reporting about things, interestingly, not necessarily China, that these mainstream organizations don't report on. For example, South America, particularly Venezuela, I remember coming up as, as a big topic. But other parts of the world that maybe these other uh, more mainstream outlets don't do as much of. Now, whether they actually do that or not is another issue. I've been able to watch a lot of them, although you can uh, watch their programming on the internet. But um, I was interested in this because part of the general topic I'm talking about today is how the internet and new media has changed journalism. And it seems like Al Jazeera English is, is, to some extent, a success story for that kind of thing that they're talking about, of giving a different perspective than the mainstream American news on things that concern Americans, such as the Arab Spring. Uh, and it was interesting to me then also that, that Melissa is an employee of, of this organization rather than one of my, say, one of these great institutions of American journalism. Uh, and thus, maybe that is facilitating some other aspects of your journalism or, or not. Uh, so I thought maybe you could comment on that and we could also hear from the other panelists. Um, so two points. Um, in terms of CCTV wanting to be out there in English, I certainly heard that from CCTV staffers in Beijing as well. And the one thing I would say is that um, I work for Al Jazeera and we regularly ask Israeli government spokespeople to go on our shows and they accept and there is an interview on broadcast. The day CCTV invites the Dalai Lama <laughs> onto their show, I'll start taking them very, very seriously. But I cannot at the moment, and I don't think that you two can either, imagine that happening. So therein lies the difference. Um, as for a little bit more about Al Jazeera, we have some 60 bureaus around the world, and it made, of course, obvious sense to have a presence in China when it launched, the English language channel, when it launched in late 2006. And um, we were given a mandate to try to cover the country in ways that hadn't been covered before. I think it was you know, quite lofty and perhaps um, not very fair on what the journalism that was actually being done in China um, by English language print and uh, television. Um, but we did try to explore that. I know that I, because of my expulsion, there's a little bit of a focus on human rights reporting in China. Uh, but the same year, when I left in 2012, you know, I did a four-part series on why everyone supports the Communist Party. There are 78 million members. It's still very, very popular, despite the fact that we look at all the, you know, no news is good news, we're also looking at the problems in any given country. Um, and lots of people complain about what's happening in China and the increasing gap between the rich and the poor. But the fact of the matter is that most people, you know, grudgingly perhaps, but support the party. And so that was 
you know, a story I did um, that was intentionally to try to flip things on its head. Um, so Al Jazeera has, you know, pushed us to do that. I mean, the other thing, though, I mean, is that Al Jazeera's funding is very different than the model that CNN or um, the Baltimore Sun has. You know, it's not meant to be profitable as yet. Um, it is funded by the government of Qatar. The finance ministry writes out a check every year uh, to the channel. And that's what's different. Um, you know, the financial crisis did not affect the channel as much as it did the other journalists in China. So when the BBC was pinching pennies about where they could go in China and what they could and they couldn't do based on the budget, uh, we were still traveling. Uh, I averaged at one point, there was a 12 to 18 month run where I was traveling once a week somewhere in China. I agree with what Melissa says, but I think I, in terms of degree, I mean, I don't think, I think even if CCTV has a dialogue on, they're still not going to be a credible news source because if you have, okay, so let's say there's a story that CCTV wants to do that might make China look bad. You can't trust the reporting because you just assume that they're going to do something, that it's going to be planned in some way that this in the end, we'll make China look bad. So interviewing the Dalai Lama, for example, maybe there's a calculus somewhere where they say, OK, we'll have the Dalai Lama on, we'll win a lot of credibility, and then we can continue our mission of making China look good and keeping the Communist Party in power. Uh, until, the, until CCTV can jeopardize, you know, has the ability to jeopardize the Communist Party's uh, ability to keep power in China, I don't think they can be credible. I have an interesting story though from um, uh, a Chinese journalist based in New York who works for a much more independent publication. But he was talking about his interactions with the um, the people that CCTV in America has hired to work in their offices in New York. And it's just kind of interesting. I don't know. If, I, don't, I don't think it's going to lead to um, this being a uh, successful venture. But um, but yeah, they they hired good journalists, because the whole idea of trying to make this into a credible organ is that you need to have some degree of professionalism, but then of course the journalists who work there want to do their jobs and they want to do it, they want to do their jobs well, and so there have been some really interesting cases of journalists at CCTV America really um, fighting back against the limitations on what they're supposed to be reporting on and how they're supposed to be reporting it, and at least one or two cases kind of breaking through and um, and getting, in one case it was just a word choice, but getting a word into a story that they produced that would have never gotten into a story um, in China. And so, I mean, uh, again, I'm not, I'm not optimistic that this is going to lead anywhere uh, too profound, but I think, you know, what's really interesting about this venture is just how much conflict there is between the aspiration of being a credible international news organization and of this the circumstances of um, you know, the, the goal of being a credible international news organization and the goal of also being a mouthpiece for um, for the, the state. Um, but there are really interesting countervailing pressures because I think the model is, you know, the paradigm is CNN, Fox News, to a certain extent, Al Jazeera, and it's very hard to imagine um, CCTV 68 without in some way conforming to that paradigm, but of course they can't because they've got this other mission, which is to um, be a mouthpiece for the state. Yeah, I think Susie makes a really good point. It kind of relates to the domestic journalism in China, too, because recently there was this issue at Southern Weekend, right, where there, there, was, there were censorship issues, and this related to microblogging in China because there was public outcry because of the uh, Restraints that were being to the public's view unreasonably uh, placed on, on uh, you know, was it the, the journalists themselves, uh, uh, editorial decisions that were not popular. And so this kind of controversy would not have happened in years past so much. So that there's begun to open up a space uh, for debate about censorship and the degree to which it's appropriate for the government to interfere in. in Journalism, and so it, it, you know, optimistically, it looks like a little bit of light is opening up. The only reason I bring that out is because the issue was brought up before of 
Chinese journalist per se, and I think it was Isaac who said it, that you know, these are people who take their jobs seriously and, and, and they know they're working under constraints and they make an effort to uh, ad adhere minimally to those constraints while at the same time pushing the envelope as much as they can. So, I, you know, I, I guess the real question here is whether things are changing in, in a positive direction or if it's just a mental system, this kind of thing. I'm kind of more towards this <laughs> I think Weibo is definitely a big difference. Uh, that's huge. Um, I think uh, 2011, a lot of Chinese people that I interviewed said that, you know, Ken's Adams is the most important story of the year. You know, however, there have been a lot of examples in years past of Chinese news organizations struggling with censorship with similar results. Uh, I didn't cover this, but I think it was about 2005, 2006. There was a supplement of Beijing Daily called Freezing Point, which had a lot of strident remarks. It was then shut down. Uh, there was this journal, uh, I guess, what, Nen Long, Nen Long, but that, I mean, just spring out of some ancient poetic illusion. Uh, that has also really pushed hard for having a little more leeway. And I think they have a little more success because they're staffed by top government. And that, you know, people you know, have really good government connections they push in a more diplomatic way. Um, but I don't see this set of mechanics uh, symbolizing any more openness in terms of the government's response to censorship. I mean, I think it's nice that a lot of this was, was able to come out through Weibo, so we have more information that way, but it's not that the government is allowing more light to be shown. Yeah, I guess it's also not the case that the existence of Weibo has suddenly made the citizenry of China is cynical about the government because that was has been true for many generations already. Uh, so there's this there's always been this sort of crust in, in what lies underneath. But we now, because of Wei Guo, have access to much more genuine discourse, uh, and, and that's a good thing. I think I've been dominating and questioning too much uh, at this point. I'm sure a lot of you have things you would like to ask the panel. Uh, so I'd like to open the uh, the floor uh, to questions from the audience. Yeah. Um, my question is for Ms. Chan. Could you talk a little about what you're doing at Stanford? And my yeah. kind of question is, if Chinese journalists or if Chinese people are trying to get into journalists' accounts, what would they do with that information? Like buy stuff with your credit card? You know, like, like what is the security aspect of it? And, um, the difficulty with analyzing malware and um, phishing emails that we receive is that we can trace it back to. If, if you give it to a, a technologist, they can trace it back to a server. At, uh, they've been traced back to servers in Hong Kong and Chongqing. But they've also been traced back to servers in the United States. Um, you just never know if there's another layer of server somewhere out there, and this is just being routed through the United States or routed through Chongqing, and it isn't pointing to um, Chinese individual hackers or Chinese um, state-backed hackers. Um, but it is true that we get emails and they've been increasingly sophisticated. So it used to be, you know, broken English like click on this link or open this file. Um, R A R is the you know extension of the file. So clearly like, you know, um, something that you don't want to open up. Um, but I would say in the last you got some too, I'm sure. Um, in the last uh, eight, 18 months or 24 months, the last two years, um, emails got increasingly polished. So now, like, uh, an email carrying malware that appears in your inbox is perfect English. Um, maybe, if I remember Ogilvy, the PR company, sending out an email to journalists to sign up for a press conference, here's the document, fill it out, send it back to us to register. It wasn't from Ogilvy, the PR company. It was a piece of malware. And if you open up the document, you know, there was the, the, the piece of, uh, you know, sign-up sheet to print out. So it all was legitimate. And meanwhile, in, in the background, um, the malware has been uploaded onto your computers, and essentially every single piece of information on your computer can be taken and uh, sent to another server for um, reading. So the project at uh, Stanford is to better improve digital security. I mean, one thing that everyone tells us is that it's a losing battle. You're a journalist, you did not study computer science or engineering. You're not a specialist in encryption. And there are people out there who are going after you, not just in China, but also in Syria, Bahrain, um, you know, Egypt, 
um, Mexico, anywhere where in our journalists they are being targeted. Um, and we really don't know who these players are, but we know that they are out there and we know that our computers are not safe. Uh, in recent years, we sort of, a lot of us certainly, um, operate on the assumption that our, our emails are just read. So uh, I never really put anything too sensitive um, in email or we try to contact some, somebody by email to arrange a meeting time. Um, in many ways, uh, with all the technology out there, we've sort of gone backwards and done it. I've gone, ended up doing the old-fashioned kind of journalism, which is pen and paper is the safest thing, not your computer, and um, meeting people in person, calling them with a, with a payphone instead of your cell phone, because um, I have certainly have had firm evidence that my phone was tapped, um, and so on and so forth. That's a really good point because um, we didn't bring up this issue recently of the New York Times and the Washington Post and many other news organizations being hacked into their systems. Uh, this coinciding with a massive attack on Twitter. Uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, I assume, you know, in answer to your question, that what, if, if we assume this coincidence means that there's Chinese hacking into American media, the idea is to get the contacts and sources uh, of the journalists, right? Uh, and uh, I suppose if they can get your credit card information, that's icing on the cake. <laughs> but, but for me, is, is there a threat? You know, uh, it's a whole uh, idea of like cyber war and stuff like that. Like, do you feel like you'll be physically harmed, or are you worried about your sources? I'm, I'm not worried about myself. I mean, as I said at the beginning, um, to supplement what Isaac was saying, I'm not worried about physical safety in China. That's the one thing is they don't kill journalists like they do in Russia and China. Um, you know, um, what you're worried about is your sources. I've interviewed people who later have been intimidated by local police and beaten up. One guy was beaten up so badly that he couldn't see for a while, and I was absolutely terrified and worried out of my mind that I was somehow responsible for a guy going blind. Thankfully, he regained his vision after a few days. He was just too black and blue eyed from uh, the beam. But that, that's what happens to people who speak to us. and. Um, you know, uh, this has more to do with phone surveillance, but we were doing, uh, embarking on a nine-day trip to Xinjiang in far western China, where there's a large minority population of Muslims. Actually, very few people know there are tens of millions of Muslims in China. And actually, the three stories we were doing were really, really um, not sensitive stories. You know, they weren't human rights stories or anything. One was looking at trade and economy, and we're going to visit a dairy farm in Xinjiang, of all places. But we did need a translator, and so we called and a, a few places and found somebody that could translate uh, from Chinese to the Uyghur language, which is the Turkic language. And when we got to the airport and we were in Beijing or about to fly to Xinjiang, um, translator calls us and says, I can't do this. And I said, well, what, what, what do you mean? But like, uh, police came over to my house last night at 11 midnight and took me away. My wife and child, they were screaming, crying, and they're terrified. I can't do this anymore. And so we ended up flying to Urumqi without a translator um, and just bumbled our way around for nine days. The entire time, even though we went to three cities, we were followed by two unmarked cars with four men in each car, so eight people. Oh my God, it was so important. Um, followed us for nine days, and I guess they had eight people because each time we got to a location to film, um, you know, one of the men would get out of the car and follow us. Since there were eight of them, you wouldn't see the same guy like over and over again. Um, but that was the result of a uh, phone hack, essentially. You know, that they knew that we were there, and they also knew where we were flying to and stuff like that. So it seems that uh, the popularity of Weibo in China might be a way to reduce what you talk about as the circle of fire around journalists in terms of harming those that you interview or whatnot. At least before strictures that came in requiring people to use their actual names, which reduces that a little bit. But it still seems to be a bit of a problem in that it's a it's a passive resource. Um, so you, there's, I've noticed there's a lot of blogs that. As you mentioned, Tea Leaf Nation or blog or read Chinese social media for you and kind of summarize it. Do you see any way of turning that into a channel to do interviews or to do kind of active research? 
I, mean, I think it's similar to Twitter in that if you follow someone and they say something interesting, and you can reach out to them through Wikibor, it's like, easier to get the contact information. Um, but, I mean, on the one hand, while it is passive, in fact, there's a lot of people in China who feel it's a liability to talk to a foreign correspondent. Um, you know, sometimes it's a regular person, sometimes an academic or government official, and maybe they're saying the same thing uh, on Weibo that they say to you, they're just not willing to do it because they're going to ask the questions, or they might get in trouble because they're seeming to be too close to foreign media. I mean, I mean, they just might not look too good for them, so I think Weibo is a great resource for that, but just putting the information out there. We've actually used Weibo to act to just do a story. So uh, there was this, uh, I didn't catch it, my uh, producer did, but there, there were claims on people from the accounts that the woman had had a forced abortion. And government officials had gone and dragged her from her house and she was eight months pregnant. And they, um, she had a forced abortion and she's still in the hospital. Well, I got that around 4 p.m. in the afternoon. We were on the plane by 7 p.m. And um, we got there the next morning and snuck into the hospital and there she was. The dead fetus was still inside her, and that became a major story for really, for, 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 for us. Um, so that was you know, confirming what was written on the Wikipedia by going there. And I actually think fair number of journalists are starting to do that, especially if they find something very intriguing. Uh, we've seen um, people post, you know, on Chinese Twitter um, about protests that were on, were taking place in some small village. And again, uh, you know, sometimes this I'm so tired, or I don't want to go, but you know, we ended up going. And indeed, there is an ongoing protest, and that becomes a full, you know, full report for us. You know, I, there was a land grab in Zhejiang that um, basically the only reason why we knew about it was because it was written about in the report, and it wasn't by that many people. Um, it was just something that just kind of you know, appeared in the ticker, so it's been very useful. story 
um, because they're not operating in the vacuum. They're operating based on the information out there, trying to present a clear picture. Um, I do tend to agree with you on coverage in Tibet. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people do tend to see Tibet as some sort of uh, fairyland, and forget that Tibetans are people too, and that you know they hate the Chinese. You know, a lot of Tibetans really, really you know, feel the same way about the Chinese as the Chinese feel about Tibetans. Um, I also do think that there was a lot of criticism on China for what it was doing to Tibet, and I think the Chinese have come up with a great strategy to uh, get rid of that criticism, and that's just for them to close off Tibet. Um, you know, I think the reporting of Tibet is a lot less uh, negative and prevalent than it used to be, because it used to be able to go to Tibet and get a sense of what's going on. But in mean, the past two years, I think it's been extremely difficult, near impossible, for acting journalists to get to Lhasa and to see what's going on. So a lot less stories. We have very little idea what's actually going on in Lhasa. And that's, I guess, a PR success for China. I would just say, in um, answer to the main part of your question, this is a little bit what I was trying to say, is that I think that there are certain preferences and choices that journalists make, not, as, not because of pressure, um, but just because of the kind of, the, the nature of the beast. Um, and in some ways, the way that journalists are trained, and I didn't go to journalism school, but you know, I think that there is a kind of part of the, the sort of uh, professional ethics of, of, of journalism as it's practiced um, in the U.S. and in the West is to sort of go after um, things that are covered up or hidden or that are that you know I mean, there's a, there's an emphasis on uncovering hidden truth and I think that that emphasis is heightened in a place like China where the um, where the local media isn't as free to do that as it is in other countries. And then I also think, I mean, I've never seen interest in this conversation, that the fact that there are restrictions on foreign journalists becomes part of the story all the time, right? It, it, um, you know, we, there are so many things that we could be talking about about being journalists in China right now, but we keep talking about censorship, and we keep talking about the limitations, and I think that that also kind of, um, leads into people's coverage because we're all human and you know we're in the, the sort of in some way that the sort of the frustrations of being a journalist in China can then sort of become the story. And so I think the combination of the tendencies of journalists in general and then this particular environment in China mean that certain subjects are covered much more than other subjects and in a way that I think does give a kind of disproportionate emphasis to um, aspects of life that may not be felt in an everyday way by large swaths of the population. Um, but it's a really complicated question because, you know, there's also, you know, I've also had conversations with Chinese students where they said, well, why are you guys banging on and on about, um, this is an example, what's this? Some person, and we never even heard of him. I mean, we never even, or why do you, or even, you know, with students that particularly were born in the 90s, you know, why are you foreigners just so obsessed with 1989? We don't even talk about it. We don't even, well, there's a reason why they don't talk about it, you know, and it's because people are not allowed to talk about it. Um, so I think, I think it's a really complicated question, but I, I do think it's important for journalists kind of in our position to think about whether there are ways to broaden the picture that we give of China. And I um, I think it's a complex, it's a really complex question. And I have good friends who are very, very, have very, very different opinions about um, how this should work. You know, some of them just, have just totally stopped reporting on politics because they feel like there's such a need to remedy um, the imbalance of um, political coverage versus coverage of you know the lives of ordinary people, um, which is not to say that the lives of ordinary people don't always don't also encompass politics in some ways. But um, um, it's a good question. I wanted to add a little bit of the moderator. I should probably be talking so much, but one thing your question reminded me of is I've, I've seen uh, Kaiser Wolf a couple of times talk to groups about uh, 
the issue of the internet and censorship in China. And he often, he kind of makes an extreme case. I, I don't necessarily agree entirely with what he says. But he says the Western media always creates this picture that uh, uh, almost everybody in China wants to use the internet to talk about human rights and, and dissidents and all kinds of things like that. He says, that's the furthest thing from the truth. He's saying like 90% of the people in China who want to use the internet want to get NBA scores, you know, and they, they're, you know, they're, they're talking about all kinds of local and domestic things, some of which are politically sensitive and some of which are not. But they're certainly not like, the, the way to view censorship is not like the, the government is putting shackles on the vast majority of the population, all of whom want to say things that, that, that uh, threaten the legitimacy of the regime. Uh, and so, the, you know, you can disagree with that or agree with that, but I think he's making a good point. I think it's a good point, but I think it's also important to remember that when John Z, when a Chinese actress has a sex scandal that, you know, 30 million or 100 million people in China are talking about, it's not really that important for America or America's understanding of China. Um, however, you know, in certain high-profile human rights cases, uh, you know, that's, even if that's very unknown to the vast majority of people in China, still might be more important for American readers. Actually, there's John Z and then there's Yao Chen, right, who is uh, also a famous actress, but she's saying things that are kind of pushing the envelope of political sensitivity, which makes her a really interesting phenomenon in the way world. world. And just to add, and this is generally um, not about less about China, but about journalism. Um, I, I, I do hear the, you know, um, why is all foreign media always covering China in a negative light? And I'm sort of like, have you ever read, read the New York Times and <laughs> seen what they say about the U.S. government? Um, or any other country. <laughs> yeah, I mean, or any other country. I mean, go and read the New York Times and just see what they say about the Obama administration. Maybe you can come back to me and have a conversation. The reality is that um, part of the nature of being a journalist, whether it's maybe it's wrong, but um, you know, it's a tendency to just see all the problems in any country you're in. So there's, like, interestingly, I think a number of questions this has come up. It's kind of like a, the, the, the shadow of a philosophical difference between our concept of what journalism is and a concept that exists in China that maybe is not the same. Uh, I, I know in my academic work, I have made the argument, at least in earlier stages of modern Chinese history, that there was a different concept of what journalism is and what it's for. Uh, and yet, on the other hand, we've been talking about the fact that journalists locally in China are trying to be more the sort of gadflies flies or, or, or looking for whatever things that they can, you know, shed light on the problems in society to what degree they can. And so there, but there's sort of a give and take between maybe different visions of what, what a journalist is, um, and probably that older sort of what you might call socialist sense of what journalism is and for is is fading away but it's still there. Um, I really appreciate the talk today. I totally enjoyed it. Um, part of the reason is that I'm actually doing my dissertation research on um, the American accent living in China. So I feel like there's a lot of like common issue conversation there, even though it's not very obvious. And that, definitely, I have actually interviewed several um, people actually working for CCTV or people who are like working as like freelancers or kind of job. Um, I have one like a very quick question and two following more elaborate questions. Uh, the first thing is that uh, I, I, I believe like one of you mentioned that there were like seven thousand uh, international reports. Seven hundred. Seven hundred. Okay. I was like thinking about it, that that number. Um, but do you know like do you have an idea about what is their turnover rate? among this group because I one thing I noticed um, from the group as the your general expat group um, is that they really have a very high turnover rate. A lot of people like half of them leave after a year and, and sometimes they, they feel like it's not a personal choice themselves. Like if they are, they are a diploma, if they are working for like the contract usually ends after a year. And they really feel there's a pressure um, sometimes from the government, sometimes from the institution they work for that really push them outside uh, China after they have been there for, for seven years. And I also have met a guy who has been living in China to, for 20 years as, a, as an English teacher, but he's having a lot of trouble uh, to get like, what, what is called a green card in China because every year it's like such a hurdle. 
for for them. So I'm wondering whether this is the same situation for journalists. What is the usual turnover rate in general? Can we just talk about this? Yeah, I, mean, I think uh, expats in China tend to, you know, it's kind of a joke that uh, you stay for a year or three years or five years, and if you stay past five years, you're a lifer, and you can't be safe. Um, and I think Beijing is, uh, there, there's a, a lot of really fascinating things about living in China, um, but Beijing is not an easy city to live in. Uh, I mean, just the pollution and the traffic. I mean, it sounds so mundane, but, you know, when you go outside, and you know, kind of, or you open your shades and it looks like blue, or you, kind of, you, know, you go outside and you're like, oh, you think around and you're like, oh no, that's right, it's smoking two packs of cigarettes. Yeah, it doesn't make it easy to be there uh, a very long time. Um, so I don't know what the turnover, I mean, I guess it's something like three to four years for the average journalist. Um, the people who stay there longer tend to be much better sourced, uh, tend to be, you know, I don't want to say better, but tend to be better. Uh, a lot of exceptions, but I'm just making big generalizations here. Mm -hmm. And I think as uh, Beijing becomes a more international city, as it becomes easier to go from, say, Beijing to Hong Kong, or Beijing to other in more livable parts, and I think mm -hmm. um, people are staying for longer, but uh, it's just kind of going. Yeah, I'm just running through my, running through my head to keep like, the people that I know at the main news organizations in China, and actually all of them have been there a really long time. And the guy that runs the Associated Press Bureau has been there for probably like 20 years. Um, there are a bunch of people that have kind of come, spent a long time, you know, as students, then done a reporting stint, then gone away for a little while, then come back. But I mean, if you run through, you know, a handful of people at the time, so spent over 10 years there, cumulatively, um, the guy who's at the New York right now has not only been there about eight years uh, and studied before. And it's, they're actually, I mean, the, and then there are people, you know, for the longest time, the people that were running the bureaus for CNN, NBC, and CBS um, were all um, people who had actually come to study in China uh, during the Cultural Revolution and just stay. They're, they're all from the Philippines. Um, but, so I think, I mean, there are maybe 20 or 25 people that we could, we're not going to go through the names of all, but I mean, they're kind of well-known journalists. But there's so much, I mean, there's a bunch of them. And then you have, to say, 150 or 200 yeah. other American journalists who stay for one to three years. Well, I wonder if it's more so like a personal choice and more like the institution kind of encourages you to stay longer because they can actually make you what valid about like reporting China. It's maybe. personal. People, people have children, yeah. and, and, and when the babies start popping out and you're looking outside and the air quality index is above 800, mm -hmm. and I would guess that right now here in Charlottesville the air quality index is 15, <laughs> um, you know, the priorities change. Mm -hmm. um, and I have another uh, interesting thing I'm going to discover about this group is that um, if I try to understand how the social media, how the internet kind of change the whole um, feeling or the situation about moving to another country, right, basically. And, uh, and I, uh, and a, a kind of question I always ask them is that uh, how do you follow up, how do you keep up with what's going on in the U.S. and what's going on in China? And um, especially among the younger generation and talking about those people coming to China after, like, uh, finished college, they're saying something like, oh, I actually really not really following on the news. That, but that's already there when I'm coming to China. Like, I never really go to New York Times recently. I never really go to the NBC. I was like, so what is your news source? And they're telling me something really interesting that there were uh, news generally VPN and access Facebook, and they were subscribed to um, some media sources like China's Mac. Have you guys heard about that site? And there are a lot of um, apps that are using the online forums, which are usually uh, regional based. And the one famous one you probably heard about is the Shanghai list. And, they, and, and I feel what, what is interesting about those forums is that they are actually serving as a local news source for the asset community. Um, and that's actually the media got a lot of attention. Sometimes they talk about something, if someone raised a question, oh, I got this from New York Times, here's the link, um, use PDN to access this. Uh, but another thing that I kind of make me 
think about this whole issue is that um, those online forums are usually not blocked in China. It's like you don't have to have an in to access that. So I feel like those kind of things can also serve as an alternative way for not for the local Chinese to access what's going on. And they're actually not talk, talking about interesting issues. And not always political oriented, but there's some. Yeah, I'll just address those yeah, really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I think you're probably asking a lot of people in terms of not reading the news, because as acting journalists in China, right. we're you know, very active consumers of the news. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, um, I remember when I was just starting out as a journalist, and I, I tried to pitch stories that in some ways reflected what was shown on the message boards, and they're just way too local. And mm -hmm. people in the States don't care about what happened to a certain restaurant, or, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think not being able to get a cab in Beijing sort of became an international story. I mean, just such like a part of your daily life there, but, you know, I mean, like, you guys don't care if you can get a cab in Beijing. But Shanghai is often runs things that are quite interesting to a broader audience. Yeah, they do a good job. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, we're just kind of local division. Yeah. 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 Very, there's a um, uh, 
pretty independent um, uh, newspaper group in southern China that's done terrific investigative reporting over the years and, and really sort of fought back against censorship repeatedly, it's censored, they fight back, they're really enterprising. Uh, paper and and this and they traditionally run an, an editorial in New Year's and this year um, the censors actually came in and complete they had written an editorial that was about the new leader uh, Xi Jinping's trip to southern China um, and actually right before doing that they had actually taken um, all, all of these statements that he had made about political reform and the speeches that he gave when he was in southern China and turned them into headlines. So they sort of highlighted the parts of his his speeches that seemed to be calls for reform. Um, and the, the censors actually came in and forced the editors to rewrite the editorial and then to run the editorial that um, they had rewritten. And then there was a there was you know, major protest about this that, that actually went out to the streets and involved people other than the journalists themselves. Um, so, but I think it's really hard to tell what kind of sign. Predicting China is a very dangerous endeavor in the future of what's going to happen. I'd just like to make a quick related point. The, uh, as foreign journalists, uh, sometimes if we choose to cover something, it will immediately become more sensitive than it was before, because then it's you know, might be embarrassing for China. And I'll, I'll give an example, I have to be vague because it was told to me off the record, but uh, a certain uh, foreign government, around the time when there was all this crap down, crap down on Mr. Gay China, and there's all these stories about China not being, uh, you know, not being uh, tolerant towards homosexuals, a certain foreign government held a, I think it was called a Mr. I don't know if it was Mr. Mr. Transsexual China. They did this like pretty big transsexual beauty pageant that did not appear in any media, and from what he told me, it was a big success. And I said, wow, that's a great story. Why didn't you tell me about it? And he said, well, I told you about it, we couldn't do it, because people would cover it, and it would be this controversial issue. Um, so I mean, a lot does happen in China that's far more liberal than maybe we know about, that just doesn't get covered, and a lot of times it doesn't get covered for a good reason. And one interesting about the Southern Weekend case was that you know, a lot of the journalists that work there have regular contact with foreign journalists, but they really went on lockdown after that happened. They would not talk to the foreign press, and I think that that was a strategic decision because they were working on negotiating their own, you know, resolution to this issue with the local government. And, and I, I think they probably knew that the second that they got on the phone to the New York Times, you know, they would lose leverage in this 